how do you undo what is already done? And, 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 and how difficult that is, because all of our understandings are geared to something that is already there. And that's very much the way it is in hockey and, and very much one of the obstacles to something different. And the first way, the first thing you've got to do is that, is that people will not look towards undoing unless one, they see a problem with what's being done. But then the second part is unless they see an alternative way of doing it mm -hmm. that they can learn. You know, that it's one thing to undo a learning, but you've got to replace it with something. So what's the something that you replace it with? So that's what I knew I had to do in this book. That if I was tracing this story of a game and how it's changed, and if the, the, the results of all of that are consequential in terms of serious injuries, it has to do with undoing something, but then doing what else. The Harbor Grace excursion with no one's to have. Books really saved my life. First of all, I love sports. I've played sports all my life. About 20 years ago, I began to notice some players whose careers had ended because of head injuries. Troy Aikman, Steve Young, and others who had gone from being superstars to ordinary players. Eric Lindros, Paul Correa. And then, not many years after that, I found that in reading obituaries of players I'd watched as a kid, Bobby Kuntz, Ollie Matson. After their great moments had been chronicled, in the last few paragraphs, there'd be mention of their difficult final years with dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. It was about then I also began reading about players who had died well before their time. Mike Webster, Bob Probert, Junior Seau. The names seemed to go on and on. It made me think about history. I love history. I'd been a history major in university. I, it made me think about the big questions in our past that we've gotten wrong. The absence of women's rights, slavery, about more current issues like tobacco, lead, asbestos, drinking and driving, and about how at times I'd wondered how people then had gotten it so wrong. How could they have been so stupid? But then, also thinking about 25 or 50 years from now, how people will look back on us and think about something. How could they have been so stupid? They'll always, we'll always get something wrong, but what are the big ones? the ones we can't get wrong. In hockey and sports, I think it's head injuries. And I think people in the future will look back on us and say, how could they have been so stupid? So I started writing articles, and I was lucky. I got almost as much space, almost as often as I wanted it, and where I wanted it. In the Globe for English-speaking Canada, in La Presse, on ESPN's big website, Grantland. And some people noticed and came up to me and told me I was really helping to increase awareness about concussions. Then time passed, and more time, years. There were more career-ending injuries, more diminished lives, more deaths. Awareness. I realized once again, isn't enough. Most of us, most of the time, who don't have authority, think awareness is enough. We hope it is enough. It has to be enough. Scientists, media, citizen activists, we think if we lay out the story clearly, 
conclusively, overwhelmingly, then those who are decision makers will make this awareness, will take this awareness and apply it. What else could they do? Except most often they don't. So we generate more awareness and more. We build a mountain of awareness so high it is unmissable, impossible not to act upon, except it doesn't turn out that way. So I decided to give it one more crack, to write a book, but to write it in a certain way. This wouldn't be about awareness. It would be about creating the conditions necessary so decision makers who had always made certain decisions would make better ones. I knew I needed to write it a certain way, and then after its release, to talk about it a certain way. First of all, most of all, it, it had to be the story of a life, of a person, a biography, written the way any biography is, about someone growing up, family and friends, moments in their lives, ups and downs. So we come to know that person, feel with him, care about him, so that when his career diminishes, when his life is changed, when he dies, it matters to us. He matters to us. Someone who makes us know so we can never forget why brain injuries in hockey matter. Who makes us know that these are the stakes. I also knew that the book had to be a story of science. What we know and don't know. What we might know soon and what we won't. To understand what science can do, how much of the answer science is, but how much it isn't, and where else the answer needs to lie. And I, need, I, I knew, too, that this had to be the story of a game, where it came from, how it changed, and why, how we got from there to here, to help us see how we might get from here to a better there. I knew, too, what my loudest critics would say, but the game is the game. It's the way it is and always will be. It's a tough game. You can't change the game. Who do you think you are even to imagine you can? I knew I had to take these critics on head on. You think you know the game? You like to think of yourselves as traditionalists, purists, keepers of the game? Well, let me tell you the real story of this game. Montreal, McGill, 1875, a bunch of rugby players. Let's start here. And let's trace the story of this game, that, the story of this game that can't change because you can't change the game. And, oh, by the way, did you know that for the first 50 years of this game, this game that can't change, until 1929, you couldn't pass the puck forward? It was rugby players. <laughs> and sport was understood as a test. And it's not a test to throw the puck up the ice. You had to earn the ice. You had to earn the ice with the puck. So passing was cheating. So passing wasn't allowed. You had to pass backwards. So what happens when you, what happens, how is a game played when you pass it backwards? It's a very, very different game. And starting in 1929, it began to be transformed. Something that needs to be known. Then time moves on. And, oh, by the way, traditionalists and purists, have you ever watched games, full games, not highlights, from the earliest films that we have 
the first days of hockey night in Canada in the 1950s, to look at those games, not what we know in our imaginations, but what in fact are there on that screen. The great years of the Detroit Red Wings and Gordie Howe, the greater years of the Montreal Canadiens winning five Stanley Cups in a row, Rocket Richard, Henri Richard, Jean Beliveau, Dickie Moore, Jacques Plante, Doug Harvey, all these great names. Watch the game on that ice and you will not believe how slow it is. <laughs> Unbelievably slow. I watched those in, in, the, in the archives in Ottawa. And they're so slow, so mystifyingly slow, that I decided that the next time I'm gonna come down with a stopwatch. There was the answer. At that time, players on average played about two minute shifts. Henri Richard, three and a half minutes every time he went out there. What happens in a game where you play two minute shifts? It's slow. Lots of open space, lots of time, not very many collisions, collisions that aren't very forceful. A very different game. This game that can't change. The 1970s, the time that I played, all of a sudden the shifts are a minute long. Why are they a minute long? Because it's the time of forechecking. The game speeds up. Why? Because we're dumping it into the corner and chasing after it. You chase after it, you go faster, you go faster, you get tired sooner, you got to get off the ice sooner, so the shifts are a minute or so long. Move ahead to today, 35 seconds, 38 seconds, not dumping it ahead, keeping possession of it, moving it from player to player to player to player for 35 seconds, off. Pass the baton to the next player, 35 seconds, full sprint, next player, next player, next player, 60 minutes, full blast. What happens in a game like that is that much less space, much less time, more collisions, more forceful collisions, and the most dangerous instrument on the ice is no longer the stick, it's the body in motion. And a body in motion that is bigger, and a body in motion that is moving faster. And what's the most vulnerable part in these collisions? The least well-protected part when it's hit by something this big and this powerful, it's the head. All of this has happened for reasons. There's a story behind all of this. And we get to a place where things are different than they were. And, and, and it, it becomes a challenge to see the differences and to act on the differences. So in 2018, we are where we are in how we play, but also in all the understandings we have of why we play the way we do and how you can't change that because you can't change the game. Except, and this is the problem, so many of these understandings come from a different time where they did make sense to this now very different time where they don't. That's where the crunch comes and the problem is. So for the book, it meant weaving all of these parts together. The story of Steve Montador and his life. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later with, with Jared. The story of science and the story of a game. That's the first 300 pages. But now, the crucial part, the last chapter, by far the longest in the book, and the questions, where do we go from here, and more importantly, how do we get there? And that, dear Jared, wherever you are, is what I hope that we will talk about tonight. So, welcome to the stage, Jared. Um, well, while I pour some water, and while I think about everything you've just said, I mean, there's so much to talk about. There's so many big ideas to get into. And I think there's a lot of stuff that's happened since the book that people 
we'll be curious to hear about. Um, but why don't you start by telling us a little bit more about Steve Montador and about that human part of this particular yeah. story? Well, Steve and, and his, his father and brother are here tonight. Steve was born in Richmond, BC, and when he was about a year old, the family moved to Mississauga. And Steve and Chris and Lindsay uh, all grew up there. Uh, and then starting, oh, sort of as a mid-teenager, Steve started to move to where hockey took him. Um, but from those I, you know, who I spoke with, um, who knew him well uh, as he was growing up, um, he, was, you know, he, he was a kid who loved to get involved in virtually anything. I mean, he was, as he was described by everybody that I met later, he was a jump-in-both-feet kind of person. <laughs> Whatever was coming up, you, know, you go for it. You go at it. You do it. You do it fully with exuberance and energy and joy and challenge, and that's what you do. Uh, he was never the best player on the teams that he played on, he was always a good player. Um, but as others would kind of peak, um, Steve would get a little bit better and he'd kind of, and the others would fall off and maybe not continue to play or move down in category. Steve would carry on and carry on. And then eventually he was drafted uh, into the OHL, played a year and a half in North Bay, then a year and a half in Erie, then an overage year in Peterborough, and then he, wasn't dra he was never drafted, uh, and he was signed as, a, as an undrafted free agent by Calgary. And, uh, and he played his first couple of professional seasons in St. John, New Brunswick. That's where the, the Calgary had their minor league affiliate. And as those years would go on, There'd be injuries in Calgary. He might get called up for a few games, go back again. The next year, maybe a few more games, a few more games, until he became a regular. And, and, his, and, and the big playing moment for him mm -hmm. came in 2004, <clears throat> when the Calgary Flames, seemingly out of nowhere, went to the Stanley Cup Finals. And, and Steve was, what was, he was a defenseman, and in the hockey parlance, he was a 5-6 defenseman, meaning that he was in the third pair of defense. The 1-2 the defenseman, they would play 25 minutes or so on the power plays, killing penalties. The 3-4 defenseman might play 20 minutes or so, and then the 5-6 would play about 15. And, and well, in, in, when the playoffs began, he was what is called a healthy scratch. He wasn't playing until Calgary got some injuries uh, and he played his first game in the seventh game of the first round uh, and against Vancouver, I think it was, and they won. And then he played all the way through the next series against Detroit, San Jose, and finally losing to, to Tampa in, in the finals. But the big moment, and it's one that all of his friends and, and his teammates recall was the first game of the semifinals against San Jose and they went into overtime and, and, and Steve was not a big goal scorer but Steve you know, was always this incredibly hopeful person that at the next moment he would be and the next moment he'd make the big play and that as others might attempt to discourage him he was undiscourageable. And so here's this moment in overtime, and the puck goes, you know, is carried into the San Jose zone, and all of a sudden, Steve sees some open ice. And he slaps his stick on the ice like he knows what he's doing. <laughs> uh, and Jerome Aginla, who was the star of Calgary at the time, hears the slap, makes the pass, Steve goes in alone and scores the winning goal in overtime. And when, when you talk to his teammates, you know, Rhett Warner was one of them, Marty Jelena another, when they recount that moment, 
they recount it with a kind of joy mm -hmm. as if they had scored the goal themselves. Mm. And, and so then, you know, Steve played longer in Calgary, then, then in Florida, then in um, Boston, Anaheim, and finally, and Buffalo, and then finally in, in Chicago. And, uh, um, and, and he just, I, I guess the only other thing I would say in that regard is that, is that there, is, there is a Steve on every team that has ever been put together, whether it's minor peewee or NHL, whether it's the 31st place team in the NHL or the Stanley Cup winning team in the NHL. There is always a place for somebody who is able to do the things that, that others don't quite do and that need to be done and knows that that's his role and, 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 and knows that it's an important role to play and there's a place on every team for somebody who's a pretty good player and a better teammate. And that was, mm -hmm. that was Steve. You know, I've, I've watched that clip of that overtime goal um, when we were working on this book, I watched it. And I watched it again and again and again. Um, because it is that exact thing, there's so much joy. But the reason I was fixated on it, I think, was because it reminds you that, well, we all remember Jerome Aginla was the star of that team. Mm -hmm. This game, every day, every major sport like this at this level, but this game in particular, puts so many people um, in a position of you know, danger, in some cases, with the game as you describe it. And I found that clip so incredible to watch because it reminds you, and this is why, for me, Steve's such an effective um, focus for, for that part of your story, because you might not know all these people's names, but these are real human beings, and these are real kind of lives on the line. So I wonder if you can start, you know, you, you kind of hinted beautifully there about this last chapter. The last chapter of this book um, begins with the sentence, I think, so where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. um, I want to help, I want to answer that. I hope, I, I'm going to ask you to answer it, frankly. But before we do that, maybe you can give us a little bit of, you know, where are we right now? Yeah. What has happened in the last two, three months since this book's come out? Well, I think it, it, it depends on whether the answer is on the ice or off the ice. I mean, I, 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 mean, I can tell you about my few months and, uh, and then uh, you know, the, on, on the ice. I mean, the, the thing that becomes and, and, you know, a very interesting component in all of this is, is that, I, as I said earlier, this is a book about how change happens, mm -hmm. how it usually doesn't happen, but how it, it might happen. And, and, and one of the, you know, the, the, the big, ob the, you know, really kind of the first and overwhelming ob obstacle in most instances is, um, is that we, we do what we have always done. Mm. That's what we know. That's what we are good at. That's what is not disorienting. Uh, that's how we see things. And so we continue to do what we've always done. The problem becomes is that things may actually have changed. And so we may do what we've always done, but it doesn't fit so well as, as it once did. And there's a, there, there's a really interesting book that came out about a year ago um, uh, called The Undoing Project mm -hmm. by Michael Lewis, and who you may know from writing Moneyball and The Big Short and other books like that. And it's a book about two Israeli-American psychologists named Daniel Kahneman and, and Amos Tversky. And um, essentially, it, 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 it's about that, is, is that how do you undo what is already done? And, 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 and how difficult that is, because all of our understandings are geared to something that is already there. And that's very much the way it is in hockey and, and very much one of the obstacles to something different. And the first way, the first thing you've got to do is that, is that people 
will not look towards undoing unless one, they see a problem with what's being done, but then the second part is unless they see an alternative way of doing it mm -hmm. that they can learn. You, you know, that it's one thing to undo a learning, but you've got to replace it with something. So what's the something that you replace it with? So that's what I knew I had to do in this book. That if I was tracing this story of a game and how it's changed, and if the, the, the results of all of that are consequential in terms of serious injuries, it has to do with undoing something, but then doing what else? So that, you know, has been the target of the last number of months. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and, and, and really in, in hockey, and it's very, it's very interesting because I would, you know, people would correct me and then I would re-correct them. Is that, <laughs> and, and, and when it would be like decision makers, uh, you know, and, and that in hockey, you know, well, there are several decision makers. There's a commissioner, there's the board of governors, the, you know, the, the owners in their hats as well as their board of governors hats, the NHL Players Association, the International Ice Hockey Federation. No, actually, I'm really being quite precise and specific by saying the decision maker. There really is a singular decision maker in hockey. And it's not something that Gary Bettman started out intending to have happen. It's not something that the, his employers, the Board of Governors and Owners, intended or anything. It, but it has happened over 24 years, hmm. in part because um, you know, the, of, of how he has run things for 24 years. In part, it's the trust. In part, it's the major victory of the NHL owners over the players in 2005 after the lockout and the implementation of a salary cap and things like that. And so, you know, that, that, that it's easy to say, well, this guy is a problem, but it's like, no, 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 you know, that doesn't work to identify in that way. The fact is, is that he is a fact of life. He <laughs> is there. He does have this position with the NHL. They, the, you know, those who are his employers like him a lot. He has signed a new contract that goes into 2021 or something like that. He's not going anywhere. But so, but how do you, so this is the interesting question then. You know Gary Batman. Mm -hmm. You both went to Cornell. Mm -hmm. You have a message for him and you have a book that articulates that message. How do you take it to him? How do you take it to someone who's so consolidated yeah. that power? Well, and that, and, 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 and so I, I knew that, that if one, this book needed to be written in a certain way, but second of all, as it was starting to, uh, about to be launched, it needed to be launched in a certain way. And so, you know, anything that I know about decision makers in any field is that it's, it's one thing to put them into a corner with the way things are, but if you only put somebody into a corner, all they'll do is they'll fight back even harder and you get nowhere. If you're going to put somebody into a corner with a story that you think is as complete as this one is, from, from the effects on a player to the science to the way the game is, you've got to offer a pathway out. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so the, the whole strategy of it was, I'm not going to you know, go out and get the blurbs that you usually are looking for for the back of the, of, of the dust jacket of the book. <laughs> I'm not going to go out early to, to uh, um, um, you know, the print media and to electronic media for people who are inclined to feel the same way to prepare their stories. The first person who's going to see a final version of this book is Gary Bettman. So the book was to come out on October the 17th. We met in New York on September the 20th. We had lunch. You know, terrific lunch, always is a terrific lunch, you know, with Gary. And at the end, I gave him, in, in, I mean, I, you know, we talked about the book. At the end, I gave him a book and essentially said, it is a serious book about a serious subject. And the next couple of months are going to be a challenge for both of us. Hmm. But I think that we are both, we are both up to that challenge. And that we're both ready for that challenge. 
And so he said he would read it. And, and so we'll see. I mean, since that time, there has been nothing official that I have heard from the National Hockey League. But what has been extremely interesting, and, and I knew it when you, you know, the, that publishers like Jared send you on road trips for a book tour, <laughs> but they don't send you to a whole lot of places now because <laughs> they say that the book industry can't support it. Well, it's like, give me a break. If this is a, <laughs> you know, if this is a book that, is, that relates to the rest of Canada, it's not good enough to just go Toronto, maybe Montreal because I played there, and maybe Vancouver because there's a book festival and that's the end of it and you can phone in others. Uh-uh, we're, <laughs> we're going everywhere. And so it's Calgary, it's Edmonton. Well, if we're out there, we gotta go to Winnipeg as well. Well, if we're there, we gotta go to Saskatoon. Well, if we're there. <laughs> a lot of Saskatoon people. <laughs> yeah. And, and any of you who have been to Saskatoon, if you haven't done yourselves this favor before, go to McNally Robinson Bookstore. Yeah. There or in Winnipeg. Fantastic. Okay. And it's the same in the east. You don't go any further east than, than, than Montreal. Yes, we do. So we go to <laughs> Halifax. And then I did a symposium on concussions at one time in Charlottetown. We're in Charlottetown. Jared happens to have connections in that area, so it I was went an with easier set. Sure. <laughs> but, but, and so you go everywhere, and you come to realize at a certain point that this is, it's, it's, a, you know, it's, it's about selling books to some extent, but really it's a test. It's a test of the ideas that are in a book. It's a test of how you convey that um, on the road, and it's a test that is administered to you by the other person that is there that's part of the interview. And, you know, CBC across the country, radio, TV, lots of spots, longer spots, interesting conversations, that was terrific. But the test was going to be TSN, and especially TSN radio. Whereas Why? TSN for well, those who don't know. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I mean, TSN radio here is kind of nothing. The fan is the big deal, uh, which is Sportsnet. The rest of the country, there's not really Sportsnet radio. I'm not yeah. even sure in a lot of places if it, it is. But TSN radio, yeah. big deal everywhere. And so what were they going to say? You know, easy to, to, to talk and persuade a sort of captive audience. What about, you know, that all of these stations, they're the radio and TV voice of the local NHL team. Um, they've been involved in sports forever. Uh, they've had all of, you know, these kind of conversations a little bit here and there before. You know, that they're tired of it all and this and that. What was it going to be like? It was great. Mm. <laughs> and I mean, virtually every one of them had read the book, which, which is quite is, rare. Yeah, which, yeah is really, <laughs> which is really nice. But what is also really nice is that they've seen all of this. They, they, they've been watching this. They know what happens. They interview these players who, you know, arrive, uh, you know, uh, in, you know, at, at age 20. And, and with the bright eyes and the energy and the rest of it, and they see the players at 25, and they hear them at 28, and they hear them, you know, that they know, they've seen. It's been difficult for them to kind of connect the dots, to put their finger on how, what you do about it. Mm -hmm. But once you offer an alternative way of looking at this, they've seen it. And so it, these were really, as I was saying, intense, yeah. interesting conversations right across the country. And so really in a way, and I've, I've written this article that'll come out in a couple of weeks somewhere, and, and I write the article as if it's kind of a letter from camp about the fall and these kinds of experiences. And basically at the end of this letter uh, camp, it is to say, you know, uh, and al almost a letter to camp or from camp to Gary Bettman, and is saying, you know, this has been the test. Here has been the result of the test. Mm -hmm. And what you should know 
is that all of those concerns you have about all of that audience out there that, that is completely stuck with the image they have in their minds uh, and of where this is the game and the game can't change and it's never changed and all the rest of it, it's not they're ready. ready. Well, they are ready. So it's thinking of that when you were talking earlier, you know, this is the game and the game can't change. And, and when you, I love it when you reveal that line about no forward passing and people audibly gasp. <laughs> yeah. Because it's like, what a game that must yeah. have been. Yeah. But you know, that's part of the test, the TSN radio stations, the people who've been in market, who've seen these players and who know the audiences and fans. There's another part of that test which is, you know, we kind of informally call them the hockey guys. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was thinking of the hockey guys when mm -hmm. you were talking. These guys, and my brother's a hockey guy. Yeah. You know, a diehard, game can't change, this is how it is. You went out and talked to these hockey guys, and some of them on TSN, some of them yeah. elsewhere. What, you know, what, did, what surprised you and how they saw this? Just, just as I was trying to say that, they, they get it, they understand it. I mean, the thing that, one of the things that was interesting as a way of talking about this, and, and to make it seem less strange. I mean, mm -hmm. one of the things that anybody who is suggesting change loves to do is to talk about it as revolutionary. Mm -hmm. and, and so there's, there's a sense of excitement that is around something that is revolutionary. The question is, is that it may be quite exciting to that person, but most people who hear about something that is revolutionary, they get nervous. Mm. Uh, they're, they're much less sure. And the way that, that I've always found it more effective to try to implement any, a change of any significance is, is to connect where you want to go with where you are. And so, okay, if the problem is, is, is hits to the head, you focus on hits to the head. Yeah. And this is not new stuff. I mean, I, I don't know the year that these rules were implemented, but it was way before I was born. There it was a, a, a penalty for high sticking. You don't high stick somebody's shoulder. It's to protect the head. You, there, a penalty for elbowing, same thing. It is an elbow to somebody's head. There was a recognition that the head was vulnerable. So you created special rules in order to protect the head. And so what this is about is, is taking you know, the, the, that, that same set of understandings, but with, 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 uh, you know, with, with the development of a game where in fact the head is more vulnerable now from the body itself yeah. as opposed to just from the stick that is high or the elbow that is extended. And as I say, you know, in, in the book, and it was, you know, one of the parts that I really enjoyed writing <laughs> was um, uh, it, 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 it related to a, a panel on a sports network the day after, and this was in the playoffs of 2016, I think, the day after a defenseman for Pittsburgh had hit a player on, on, on the opposing team and, and the player had been injured and the question was, was Chris Letang going to get a suspension? So this was the debate the next day and it was one of those classic debates that happens when you've got the wrong set of rules. So what was the focus? Well, was the player's head down a little bit? Was it up a little bit? Did the, you know, did Letang extend upward? Did he not? Did the other guy see him? Did he target the head? Did he not target the head? Did he want to injure him? Did he want to just deliver a lesson? Did he want to? Did he want to? Did he want to? And, and it was like, this is bizarre, you know, this kind of discussion. And it's, it's all about the, the, you know, the, the, the parsing every aspect of a hit that was made as opposed to the effect that it had on the player on the opposing team. And so I decided that that was just like a, you know, a, a, you know, a segment that I'm sure most of you have seen from Monty Python <laughs> and, and the dead parrot sketch. <laughs> and so here you've got John Cleese walking into this store and Michael Palin is the shopkeeper. And of course, Michael Palin has sold him 
a dead parrot. And John Cleese becomes aware of that when he goes home. Now he comes back. <laughs> well, you can imagine John Cleese, you know, who does insufferable better than anybody on earth and every, <laughs> anybody who has ever been born. And he knows that he's so completely right and he just cannot wait to get at Michael Palin. And so he's talking about this bird that is dead and Michael Palin is saying, well, no, actually he's resting. Uh, and then, then Michael Palin tries to distract him by saying, well, he's a Norwegian blue. <laughs> and then, and, and of course, that sets off John Cleese. And then, you know, the, then John, or Michael Palin says something like, beautiful plumage those Norwegian blues have, <laughs> and so on and so on. And so finally, John Cleese has had enough, and, he's, and, he, and he takes the bird out of the cage, whacks it on the table, throws it up in the air, it clump, clumps on the, on the ground, and he just said, that is a dead bird. <laughs> well, you know, Michael, or, or uh, John Cleese knew it was about a dead bird. That's what the whole question is about. It's not whether it's a Norwegian blue that has <laughs> nice plumage or anything else. Or it's resting. It's about whether the bird is alive or not, and this is a dead parrot. And so, you know, that, that, it, it, it's, you know, that, that, that kind of hit to the head, it's not about intentional, unintentional, targeted, not targeted, you know, this or that. You know, that, that as, I, as I say in the book, that whether the hit is delivered by a high stick, by an elbow, by a shoulder, by a fist, the brain doesn't distinguish. The brain doesn't care. This is not about the cause, it's about the effect. Mm -hmm. It's not about just the justice to the person who is the deliverer, it's justice to the person who has been hit as well. It's not about, again, intention, legality, illegality, whatever. It's about the hit. Yeah. So you focus there, you make the connection to what already exists. We All already the have these penalties yeah. to the, you know, with the elbow and the, well, you know, so then it's a shoulder and it doesn't matter whether the player had his head down a little, a lot, whether he saw it coming or whether he didn't see it coming, a hit to the head, you know, is a blow to the head, no hits to the head, no excuses. When, um, when we were... When we were in, in Prince Edward Island in November, um, we did a really powerful event. Um, and it was officials from Hockey PEI, one of the ministers from the government was there, a really brilliant woman who's uh, the head of pediatrics at the hospital in Charlottetown. Um, and for me, the most moving part was a mother and son who were on this panel with us. Mm -hmm. And uh, his name, if I recall correctly, was Nathan Molyneux. I think he was about 18 years old. And he had had, if I remember the number right, a dozen concussions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so much of what we talked, it was extremely moving to watch this. So much of what we talked about on that panel and so many of the questions from the audience that day were from parents mm -hmm. um, and from people who were involved with children playing the game. And ever since then, I think of him whenever I think of this book. Yeah. And I think about a simple question, which is, you know, all of you are people who've given up, I think it's Tuesday, a Tuesday <laughs> night, <laughs> it's been a busy week, a Tuesday night to come and listen to Ken talk about this really important subject. And as you said during your talk, awareness isn't, you know, awareness is all well and good, but we're well past awareness. Mm -hmm. So, the, you know, we have to open this to audience questions, and we're really excited to hear from you, but I wonder if you can just to leave us with a thought, you know, when I think of that kid, what can we do as mm -hmm. people who might have children of our own, mm -hmm. people who are interested, who feel a social responsibility, who love the game, any of that? Mm -hmm. What is your advice for people mm -hmm. to help? Well, I, I think the first part of it uh, in that way, and is, I mean, probably a lot of you here know somebody who's had a head injury, and it's not nice. It really is, of course, something that affects all the rest of you yeah. and, and how you function and to a point where it affects you. I mean, it, it affects the you that is you. And, 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 and you could see that, you know, in the instance that, that Jared was talking about. 
And it's one of the things that happens, you know, in this tour. Like at yeah. the end, there's, there is a book signing line, but this time there was, it wasn't just a signing line, it was a storyline. Mm. That people would come up with their stories. And, and a number of them were parents that, had, that were at a loss. And others were of kids, you know, who had gotten older and you could tell they're struggling. They're yeah. really, really struggling. And so I think the first thing, you know, is, is that understanding that, that this is not nice. And this isn't about kind of convenience and inconvenience in terms of, um, you know, changing uh, a little bit of a rule there and a little bit of a rule there, and oh, that's inconvenient. No, sorry, well past beyond inconvenience. Mm -hmm. So I think that there is that. I think there's also a feeling that, 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 that a parent has a right to feel this, that it isn't just a matter of knowing and hearing from those who are most centrally involved with the team that the game's the game, you know? I mean, you know, what are you gonna do? And it's a tough game and, and, and this and that. And especially mothers in it. Mothers get pushed to the side, usually, in terms of, of, of minor hockey. And again, when there's something that, that's concerning, it's like, well, you know, you never played the game and, and you don't really understand. And for, for that person at that moment to say, no, sorry, you know, I've heard that long enough. Uh, in fact, um, I may not have played the game. I may not know this game, but I do know something about kids. I know something about growing up, and I know something about futures. That gives me a right to feel what I feel, and what I feel gives me a right to say what I need to say. And one of the things that was just kind of fun to offer in an article, mm -hmm. and it was just kind of, just to see where it might go, <laughs> but was to say, what's the most effective community organization in terms of changing a message that I could think of? The one, the one that, I, that came to mind for me was Mothers Against Drunk Driving. You know, it was impossible. 30, 40 years ago to really deliver the message that yes, you drink, yes, you drive, but you don't do the two together. You know, that was inconceivable at that time. Well, things have changed a lot. Well, what would happen if you had Mothers Against Head Hits? M-A-H-H. -H. <laughs> Wouldn't that be kind of interesting to see what might happen you know, if, if that came to be? So I think that the first part of all of this is that, is that and, and it's what I've tried to do with this book for a whole range of people, for those who are fans, but those who aren't really fans, but who, who live in an environment where all of this exists. It is for coaches. It is for players. It is for NHL players. It is for former NHL players. It is for coaches. It is for hockey administrators, it is for the hockey decision maker, is that there is an alternative story. It isn't just one-off flailing in terms of this is wrong, that is wrong, and the other. No. There's an alternative story that came from somewhere, that is heading somewhere, that can go somewhere, that can get somewhere. And to be confident of that alternative story and so when you meet the next person who just kind of shrugs and says, you know, what do you know and the game's the game, you, can, you, you have the opportunity and the right <laughs> to say, no, uh-uh, sorry, I have an alternative story to this and I have some confidence in this alternative story and you're going to have to do a whole lot better than that. Well, it's been a great pleasure for me to watch you tell that story to people. You mentioned your tour. 
And Ken loves to remind me that he is a Newfoundland and New Brunswick stop short of having gone everywhere. So I mean, <laughs> we're what, working what, on that. What, My mother lives in New Brunswick. We'll get him there. I mean, what, what self-respecting <laughs> publisher of any self-respecting you know, book would not go to all 10 provinces? Yeah, we're, we're going to make it happen this year for sure. I, I, um, I should say one thing about Jared that really, you know, and this is that, that after the book was done, and, and like when a book is done, it's never really done. There's always another copy editor, proof editor, somebody else, you know, and, and so another month passes and it's done. Well, no, it's not, not quite, quite done. done. Yeah. It was not quite done. Well, this was August of 2017 and it was done. It was gone. I had even done the audio version, found a couple of typos in the audio version. They held up the printing of the book to make those changes. Those changes had been made. It was done, except <laughs> About two days later, I had one of those wake up in the morning at two o'clock with a thought. <laughs> and, and so it was like, holy shoot. You know, I sort of said, I mean, I more than sort of said this, but I didn't say it in so many words. Mm -hmm. And it's only seven words, Jared. And it would come towards the, the end. And it's not much of a disruption. And really, it's something that kind of embodies what I'm saying in the rest. And it has to go in. And he said, it can't go in, it's gone. I said, no, no, no. no. It's no, never no. gone. I, said, you know, yeah. And it was back and forth. And then I said, well, like, you mean that it's actually been printed? And he said, well, I don't know that it's actually. Well, then call them up. And if Find it actually way. hasn't been printed, <laughs> if the button hasn't been pushed, then here are the words. And it, they come towards the end. It's not the final right. words, but about five or six pages towards the end. And it was just w the words that said, that you know, that in, in describing Steve, and 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 what he went through is that it's not fair, not right, and not necessary. <laughs> and that was the. <laughs> <laughs> we stopped the press. We stopped the press. <laughs> <laughs> and it was worth it. It was yeah. really worth it. And to hear, you know, it, it's a great source of pride for us.